Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for how awesome you are. And I just thank you that you have set us free and uh, that we can't earn or add to anything that you did, Jesus, but rather that we are accepted and that you have filled us. We are completely satisfied in you. Lord, speak to us. Let me get out of the way. Lord, may your word be exalted. May you move in power with your spirit that when we hear what it is you want to teach us, that it would not just hit our eardrums, but Lord, that it would hit our heart and that it would result in a life that is changed. Lord, use your people. Bless Glenville. Thank you for Pastor Bruce and his recovery. And continue to be with each of us, Lord, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. Amen. All right, so we're getting started, started here this evening. Um, the book of Colossians, Paul never met the people of Coloss Colossae or Colossae. He heard from one of his good friends, Epaphras, that God had done a great work in that region. It is in Asia Minor, so modern day Turkey, a very Muslim nation now. But at that time, uh, there were churches that you may remember from Revelation, like Laodicea. And Hierapolis was a town that was very close to Colossae as well. It's about 100 miles, I believe, east of Ephesus. So Paul started and did a lot of his ministry about uh, 100 miles west of Colossae. He spent three strong and very fruitful years in if the Ephesian church area uh, where he established a healthy fellowship. So in Ephesus, he would go to the school of Tyrannius and he would reason with people and he would uh, do some arguing, so to speak, of showing them why Jesus was of Christ. And he went to the synagogues first and then later he went to Jews and Gentiles because God had called Paul especially to the Gentiles. But he definitely had a heart for the, the Jews as well. And so we saw last chapter, the major thing, if you look at the outlines that you have, Paul was combating or he was up against heresy. Even though he had never seen the people of the church of Colossae, he knew that there were things that were creeping in to try to get them to get their eyes off of what the Lord has done for each of us. So the, the biggest thing, you know, when it came to false teaching, he was concerned how, um, just like Jesus, a little bit of leaven can leaven the whole lump. A little bit of sin or a little bit of false teaching can utterly destroy a person, a church, uh, your, your fruitfulness. Because we want the word of God to come into our hearts like good soil and reap 30, 60, 100 fold. Well, if you add a little bit of poison with medicine, we all know you're going to have, you're going to be sick. So Paul was very clear in chapter two um, that he wanted people to be steadfast in their faith. Verse six, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. He wanted people to continue upon the same path that they had started, which was faith in Jesus Christ. It's amazing how false teachings and false teachers uh, I've heard it said that they travel on the wings of eagles, and it seems like the gospel rides on the back of the turtle. You know, in the church, people prey on believers and come in with this new revelation. And the Gnostics, their very name, meant to be in the know. Gnosko is knowledge, to be in the knowledge of something. And they had a lot of various false teachings about the divinity of Christ, who Jesus is, that he was actually God. They did not accept that entirely. And they made some things mystical. So people were doubting the simplicity of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul hit that head on. Um, and he very clearly said that Jesus, in verse 9, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is God. Jesus is everything you could ever need. Um, so he hits that very hard. <clears throat> he also highlighted in verse 11 the circumcision that outward sign and symbol that the Jews performed that Abraham was given from God, it is an outward cutting of the flesh, but it is an outward symbol of an inward change, and God circumcises our hearts. He gives us a, from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And so the outer ritual 
does not replace the inner reality. So you may know someone, and like we mentioned last week, you may have gone up to the altar to be saved. You didn't have the full assurance. You didn't know for sure. Know that you know that you know that you were saved and you got baptized many times or you, you came to the altar many times or you still may be struggling with, am I really saved? Am I really, do I have that assurance? Well, and here he's very clear that um, verse 11 in him you also were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by the putting off the body of, of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in the likeness of bapt, or buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So when we baptize people here at Glenville, when you're baptized, when you baptize your children, we see that happen. We say buried in the likeness of his death. That old way is done. It's not superior to the new way, which is being born of the Spirit, being born again. And the spiritual is much better than the flesh and our old ways. We were all born spiritually dead because of Adam and Eve. So very clearly here he says, you being dead in your sins, verse 13, in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven all. You all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements which was against us, which, had, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Okay, so when you look at the law of Moses, when you look at the, the Old Testament Torah, no one was righteous. And we talked about that last time. Um, and even if you could be circumcised, Paul's point is, even if you follow the Jewish law to the T and you do your very, very best, you still trespass. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took away everything you've ever done wrong. He took away all trespasses. You were dead. He made you alive. You were uncircumcised. He circumcised your heart because Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Paul is very clearly saying it's in your heart is what matters. It's not uh, the outer ritual, the outward ritual, going through the motions. Actions do not give us assurance. Works do not give us assurance. But if I do believe in Jesus Christ, then my works should show. And so that if I truly am circumcised, I was a believer in Jesus Christ for at least uh, six years before I was ever baptized. And I didn't dismiss the importance of it but the point was the Lord had all of me but I wanted to follow Jesus like he said to John the Baptist when he said we must do this to fulfill to fulfill all righteousness because John's like you should baptize me Jesus gave us that as an example that we are to tell our friends our family and the whole world that I'm not ashamed and the spirit life in the spirit I'm dead to my old self I'm alive to Christ. I was dead, and now I'm dead to my trespasses, my sins. I'm made alive, and I have full assurance that Jesus is worth living for. So very clearly there, he um, also talks about Jesus, like in Ephesians chapter 1, how he's the head. He is above all principalities and authorities, and that Jesus disarmed those authorities and principalities and all of the 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 hosts of darkness. We talked about Satan. And in Revelation, there's indication that one third of all the angels went with Satan and rebelled. And during Jesus's earthly ministry, they came up to Jesus many times and said, have you come to torment us before the time? Jesus, when he died on the cross, as we talked about last week, he disarmed those principalities, put them to an open shame, but he also took away the law and its requirements because he perfectly fulfilled the law. So, and because in verse 15, he says he disarmed the principalities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. When he died on the cross, Satan probably said yes, but the tables were turned. What Satan thought was destroying Christ actually set us free. So he had victory through his death. It's a mystery, but that is the mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ died and rose again so that we, he could then give us new life, new birth. So 
Paul's interest in chapter 2 is combating this heresy, the teaching, one, that you can be made right by keeping the law, or um, two, that you need to understand this other mystery outside of Christ when Christ is, in Christ, is all the mysteries and all the wisdom and knowledge of God. So he's saying Christ is it, brothers and sisters. Christ is it. And so we need to hold fast to him. He said, don't let anybody cheat you. We talk about false teachers when we go through Second Peter. We've been going through those letters in our community group. We are not to be deceived because people will try to cheat us. We need to hold fast to Christ. So he kind of continues on that. Um, one other thing, I think it's very, I'll just leave this last point with chapter 2. Many people will say, I'm more righteous, without saying I'm more righteous. They'll ask you, do you worship on the Sabbath? Have you ever heard someone say, well, we worship on Saturdays? Have you ever heard someone say, well, I don't eat pork? Have you ever heard someone say, oh, you, you can't get a blood transfusion? Have you ever heard some of those false teachings? Paul is combating that, saying, let no one judge you according to feast days, according to um, dietary laws and, and the Sabbaths and the new moon festivals. He says they have an appearance of what t seems to be good and wisdom, but they really don't change the way our corrupt heart and our old nature wants to rear its ugly face. They do not give you the power to live for God, and they're rooted in pride, and they're rooted in the flesh. If I take pride in how I read my Bible a lot, how I go to church, how I tithe, how I have been baptized, how I, if I take pride in that, then I'm rewarding the flesh. Jesus wants us to give and to live for him in such a way that our Father in Heaven knows what we've done, and he rewards us openly. But we, the flesh, basically they're the last verse of the chapter, they have an appearance of wisdom. Religion has an appearance of wisdom, but it lacks the power of God. He says, in self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, but they're of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Paul said, I will speak like a fool for a little while. And Paul said, there's no one that was more Jewish and more righteous than I was. When it came to the law, I was blameless, even to the point of persecuting the church. But all of that, I count it but rubbish in comparison to knowing Christ. He did all that in ignorance because it was pride-based. And Paul is telling the Colossians, don't let someone slight you. Don't let someone trick you. And as you can see on that outline, he is saying, Clearly, there is a pressure to turn away to either this mysticism of the Gnostics or an observance of the law and the Torah and being like a Jew. He says, no, Christ is all we need. Okay? So, there is a pressure. He fulfilled the law and he triumphed over all those wicked spiritual powers that try to get us distracted. Okay? He is greater than all and the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ. If you're not worshiping Jesus, you're settling. And you, you're, it's a compromise either way. So, looking at that, I have a question for all of you. Do you want the power of Christ in your life over the flesh? Do you want his power in your life? I want his power in my life. So let's pray as we open up chapter 3. Father, we pray that you give us your power. We don't want religion. We don't want mystical knowledge of mysteries that are supposedly new. We ask that you teach us and you give us the practical ways to live out this new life in the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So uh, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you, you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. And then he goes on about what we're to put off and what we're to put on. So the perspective, Paul starts out very clearly, and it might be better um, understood if we put it this way. If you were raised with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Seek the things that are above. What is he saying? Have the perspective that you are already, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, seated in heavenly places with Christ. You are already, like Jesus says, I no longer call you servant, but I call you friend. And in, in the Psalms, it says he calls us, he's not ashamed to call us brethren, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1. We are brothers and sisters in the family of God. And so here, very clearly, we're to fix our, fix our thoughts on the things which are above. Seek those things which are above. So what is our perspective? The question I would have is, when I'm making a big decision or a little decision, what am I thinking about? Am I thinking about heaven in light of this decision? There are a lot of decisions where it may seem like this is not that big of a deal. But in the spirit, if my perspective is I want an eternal perspective, I want to have a heavenly perspective, most of the time, if I'm to be honest with myself, when I error, it's because I'm going through the motions, like a, like a ritual, or I'm too busy to slow down and talk with God about it, or I'm just missing why am I doing what I'm doing in light of heaven, in light of what is this for, why am I doing what I'm doing. So it's a motive checker, and Paul is saying... If, Christ, if you really, really, really believe that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, that should change how we perceive and how we act and how we live. We're to seek. You know, there's that Matthew 7, 7 passage, one of my favorites. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. For whoever asks, receives. Seeks, finds. Knocks, the door will be opened. And you who are wicked fathers, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who, who ask? Luke, he says, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? I need the Holy Spirit. That's the best thing I've got going for me. When I'm making decisions, when I'm dealing with trials, when I'm walking in my life, that's what he's telling the church in Colossae. And Paul, if anyone, could attest to every moment, every day. My life is like an adventure. I don't know when I'm going to get beat next. I don't know when I'm going to be shipwrecked next. I don't know... If God wants me to go to Asia or Rome or he's just, it was a cliffhanger of a life. But he could say it because he was experiencing it. I hope that we can say that when we teach our kids, when we teach those that we, we love. And, and it is something about that. Hey, have you prayed about it? When someone's struggling with something, hey, let's pray about it. You know, be instant in prayer. First Thessalonians 5, be instant in prayer. Pray about everything. Philippians 4. Set your mind, verse 2, on things above, not on things on the earth. Oh. Can't put it in better words, right? Life is tough. We, we, were, we read in the book of Psalms, life is tough, but God is good. Okay, so... My husband has chronic pain. I can't make it through this day solving the problems that need to be solved. My bills are running short. Um, we have some turmoil in our relationship. Whatever the situation, God wants us to fix our mind on things above so that we don't get too discouraged because life is discouraging. This morning, uh, Enoch brought some of his Skecher light-up shoes. Um, I think... Pretty much right after he bought them, one of them broke. So I'm not trying to advertise for Skechers. But one of those shoes, his friend stepped on his shoe yesterday, and it broke like it was a Velcro shoe. So it broke right where the Velcro binds, like a V binding on the top of the shoe. But the point is, I'm like looking at his shoes, and it's, they're not repairable. But he has like a teaspoon of sand in each of these <laughs> shoes. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, how much is that like life that we go walking without even looking for it 
and we got sand in our shoes. We get rocks and stickers and cockleburs and all these things. And we're not even looking for it, right? My wife went on a hike, walk, jog with Rochelle, her friend, and uh, she got oak mites. For the last three weeks, they've been tormenting her, okay? She's pregnant already. So, you know, you don't have to go looking for it. She, and they were trying to figure out where it came from. So we washed our sheets. I'm like, I don't want this. Let me get this out that night. I fixed it. But they went on to a trail at Pawnee Prairie for maybe a few hundred yards or whatever. They just went on this trail. That's all it took. And so the point is, here, we don't, like James 1 says, you know, rejoice when you're faced with various fiery trials that are to try you. If you persevere, it produces steadfastness. If you set your mind on things above, those, those things that you're not even looking for that come in to prick you or, or that are uncomfortable. I asked him if they hurt him and he's like, Enoch's like, no, they just tickle a little bit. But if it's beyond the tickle and it's really hurting you, okay, you got the stickers, you got the poison ivy, you got the, the thing you weren't intending. I got sunburned really bad on Labor Day, okay? I thought I put sunscreen on my face. No, I did not. And I turned into Will Smith on Hitch where, you know, the eyes and the ears and nose and everything swells up. So you're not even looking for it. So that's why we need to come back where Jesus says, Martha, Martha, do what Mary's doing. Just sit down, think about me, focus on me. Um, we need to set our mind on things above, right, Dick? Set our mind on things above. It'll make those trials not seem so bad. It'll make, and that's what Paul says. These are just momentary compared to the eternal glory. And I'm excited. I'm excited to be there. I want to be there soon. But for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay. Baptism is a picture, spiritual picture of the inward change. You, your old John Simon is dead. You are now, you don't want to know the old John Simon. I don't want to know the old, I want to know the new child of God. You, know, you don't want to know the old Justin. I can talk with you about how I used to be. You probably want to believe how I used to be, but that's how I, there's not much good there. So your old man, your old nature is dead. And now your life is hidden with Christ and God. I love that because it's hidden with Christ. It depends on him, not on me. He, I'm secure because my life depends on him. And Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So my life may circumstantially seem like it's all over the place. In Christ, I am secure. I have that stability. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Can you say, Christ is my life? What a glorious truth, right? We can say, Christ is my life. Like, he's everything. And I think that many people stop short. They want Christ for salvation. But then they don't realize, that's, that's it. That's all I need. Like, he's... You want to... It's hard for me to be enthusiastic about certain things. But Christ, it's like, I am, he does it for me. You ever feel really lonely because you're around a bunch of people who don't ever want to talk about Christ? Have you experienced that loneliness? Okay, go to a family get-together where there's a lot of people who really just don't care about him. I feel that way. That's, he's my life. And I'm looking for his, like Titus says, the great and glorious returning of Christ our Savior it's a blessed hope that we have. There's a little cross-reference here in 1 John 3, verse 2. Let's look at that together real quick. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it is not, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3.3 3 is one of my favorites. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So when you are looking forward to the coming of Christ, it has this purifying influence in your life. We're looking, but not only are we looking for his second coming, we're looking for him coming 
in our lives by us abiding in him and that life that he has. When you're empty and you're broken and you're depressed and you are losing that perspective, you get your, you get your eyes on Christ. It's amazing how he gives us that satisfaction. He gives us the promptings. He gives us the energy and enthusiasm that we can't have on our own. And John 14, 6, of course, he's our life. When Christ, our life, who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. John 14, 6, remember, Thomas says, you're, you keep talking about the way, Jesus. Show us the way to the Father. He says, I've been with you so long. Have you not understood? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. So Jesus is our life. And he's also our way. And he's also our truth. He made it super clear. So if I'm finding any satisfaction that my life is rooted in anything but Christ, I'm going to be disappointed, right? If Christ is my life, anything short of him in any of my pursuits is going to disappoint. It's going to disappoint me and disappoint. Um, there's such a potential when I put my, my hope in him. So that's the other thing. We're going to appear with him in glory, in his second coming. There's some mystery to that, you know, but when he comes, um, there, if you look at Isaiah and you look at Revelation, there's indication that he's going to set up a thousand year reign. It's very small, very small indication in Revelation 20. But if we do come with him, let's say the rapture occurs, whenever it occurs, we have the wedding supper like it talks about in Revelation. And then he comes and sets up a kingdom for a thousand years. If that's the way it goes, it says we will come, like it says in Jude, Second Peter, or it says in Jude and that Enoch prophesied it, that we will come. That the Holy One will come with all of his, his saints, all of his, his, us as believers will come with him. But the point there is that we will appear with him in glory. 1 Corinthians 15 says, incorruptible will be put on by that which is corruptible. We're corrupt. We're going to put on incorruptibility. In the twinkling of an eye, this, this mortal body will be changed into a spiritual body that we don't really fully comprehend that. But in an instant, it says we're going to share in that. We're going to be transformed. So then we go to be with the Lord. And he sets up this kingdom, but at the end, he makes a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And we will live forever and ever for his glory and for our good. So I'm looking at that. We're going to, we have such an awesome thing to look forward to. Anybody have teeth problems? Anybody have health problems? Anybody have uh, emotional problems? Okay. We won't have to deal with that forever. It's going to be awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. Probably won't have to floss anymore. So it'll be awesome. On a lighter note. But no, we're going to appear with him in glory. Therefore, because of that, we will be glorified. You will have an eternal body. You will live forever in heaven with the Lord. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, so if we look at those fornication, that's... Sex outside of marriage, plainly put. It's homosexuality, heterosexuality, whatever you want to look at it. It's any sex outside of marriage is fornication. So God sees it all as one thing. Um, I, th I know that, that there's a bad rap out there that one is worse than the other. No. Fornication is fornication. It's sexual sin. So we look at that. Additionally, he says uh, the word uncleanness. Um, when we look at uncleanness, we're, we're talking about uh, perverted. Okay? Uh, you have clearly, uh, have you ever met somebody who's just foul in their attitude, what, what they're thinking about, what they talk about? I used to be one. <laughs> and that's what he gets into here. Um, but uncleanness, just perverted. Every, always, why is it that when I turn on sitcoms that every punchline has to do with sex or some sort of sexual innuendo? And I think very clearly um, the word uncleanness, impurity, um, or being basically the quality, impurity, it's distorting what was made to be beautiful. Sex and marriage is a beautiful, pure thing. And here you're laughing about it. Or about somebody's anatomy. 
Why is that so funny? The Lord says, let that, let's, let's mortify that. Let's put it to death. Then he goes into, um, in some translations, inordinate affection or passion. Um, concu concupiscence, but it's uh, lust. Do you think our culture as a whole has a problem with lust right now? We are, we are definitely bent on lust. Um, and that actual word there um, is pathos. Our culture is pathological in its bentness toward lust. Do you know? Do you know that pornography profits more than all athletics combined and all of Hollywood combined? Did you know that? All professional sports combined, pornography out profits in our country, and that is the United States of America. So we're to put that to death. How do you put it to death? You cut it off. And for our young people, we pray that the Lord would keep them pure. Um, the next word there, evil desire. And that's very, I mean, there's an Isaiah that says people that invent new ways to do evil. Right? It's amazing to me how you don't have to look for evil on the internet. It just comes and finds you, right? You find one news article and then there's five other things. Where on earth? I don't need to look that hard. And that's why Proverbs warns us about the evil, the evil of the world and, and not to be with murderous people. Um, and then covetousness, which is idolatry. So covetousness, you know, that's, it could be you know, extortion, fraud. It could be just being greedy, plum greedy. But a lot of covetousness is on steroids these days because you can watch television and find out just what kind of houses people live in. And you have nonstop advertisements geared toward us to make us non-content, malcontent. Don't appreciate what you have. You have to have this. With money you don't have, to impress people you don't even like, you're buying things you don't need. And that is, that is strictly the, the marketing method. They make money on you buying things you don't need, period. So in heaven, and I, I believe it's very clear in the scriptures during the kingdom age, there will be no one defrauding his brother. Everybody will have their own thing. And if this is the kingdom, if I'm reading this right in Isaiah it's, uh, and in Zechariah, everyone will uh, dwell under their own fig tree, and eat the fruit of their own vineyard. I mean, if you look at heaven, the 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles, the four square of heaven that we read in Revelation, there's enough for every, if we have like 20 billion people, for every person to have hundreds of acres, I believe, or 20, 30 acres. Like there's gonna be so much room, not that we're gonna be living for that. I'm just saying there's just so much room. The greed that our sinful nature has will be non-existent People will be sharing. There won't be this need to capitalize on each other. Capitalism will be a thing of the past. Capitalism, when you do it in very small increments and you're doing it ethically and people agree to it and it's fair, okay. But greed, in James it says that the wages of the laborers cry out against you. Those who you defrauded and you held back their wages when they cut your yards. Guess what? The Lord of Sabbath, the Lord of rest, and the Lord of heaven and earth hears those cries and God is just, and he will repay. Recompense is his, he will repay. And so if people don't repent from their greediness, it's caused so much heartache in our world. So we need not be greedy. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So we all used to be these things. Everything we just talked about. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you used to do them, you used to be them. You couldn't help but do that. You couldn't help but be greedy. You couldn't help but covet. You couldn't help but be corrupt. And you thought it was fun to boot. And then Jesus comes into your life and you're like, that's not fun anymore. I just don't even care about that anymore. And it's just all of a sudden your values change. Your guy, I mean, your eyes change, your ears change, the way you talk, your hearts change, so now your words change. And no one has to tell you that. Christ does the work. 
but the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Well, what about that? Okay, well, Jesus took our wrath on the cross, remember? He took our wrath on the cross once and for all, died for every one of our sins. But God is going to pour out the cups and bowls of his indignation and the trumpets of his judgment, and he will make those who have martyred the saints to drink blood themselves. He's going to pour out this vengeance and this wrath upon an unbelieving world. And the book of Revelation says over and over and over, and yet they did not repent, and yet they did not repent, and yet they did not repent. And yet Isaiah, I believe it is, he says over and over, my hand is stretched out still. The Lord of heaven and earth is saying, my hand is stretched out to rescue you as you could be saved. My hand is stretched out. It's not stretched out like I'm about to whoop you. It's, it could be, but he, the whooping is so that I can embrace you and say, come out of them, my people. Come, eat those who don't have any money and eat the bread that will fill you forever. Come and drink. Buy or, or take what cannot be bought. He's like, I'm freely giving you eternal life. And the highway to holiness, it's this, it's this path that you can get on. But you have to trust in me is what the Lord is saying. But they did not repent. So that wrath, he's going to pour out his wrath upon an unbelieving world. But we see, I think it's in Romans 5, 8, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, that we are not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. We as believers are not subjects of that wrath. So verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man and his, with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Whether it is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all, or Christ all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So, there are some things we're to put off. I like how Paul keeps it simple. Put this off. That's your dead man. Put it off. It's dead. It may try to come back from the dead and resurrect and come back into your life. But he says, put this off. And then later, we're going to see... Um, Verse 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So verse 14, he's saying, put on love. He kept it simple because we sin in millions of ways. Put that off. There's only one way to love, and that's in Christ. You've got to have the love of Christ in you. There are some people that are very unlovely. I'm unlovely at times. You know, we all have that propensity. He says that just as Christ has forgiven you, so show that mercy and kindness and patience and gentleness, long-suffering, and that love to others, right? Christians, born-again believers, my friends, my brothers and sisters, we should be characterized, like we said last week, by thankfulness. Our life should be marked with gratitude and thankfulness, and our, mark, our life should be marked by love. So let's look at a couple of those things before we move on. When we talk about what we put off, is it okay to be angry as a Christian? There can be justifiable anger. There can be punishment. But it's that anger that the New Testament teaches, in your anger do not sin. Okay, Use that anger um, to please the Lord. If you're angry about something, it's a good indication that God's probably angry too. But if you may be wrong, get more information, pray about it, let the Lord deal with that anger. Wrath, though, on the other hand, that's that passion. I work in the prison. You see people who, in a, in a fit of passion, commit a crime. Or uh, that passion of, they just I, just, I just lost control of myself. I just, I just lost control of my temper. I'm German. What can I say? You know? I mean... It's just what, what I do. No. 
It's not a cultural thing. You're now, remember last uh, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, he's ransomed you out of the kingdom of darkness, placed you into the kingdom of his son. You can't claim rights to that old kingdom of darkness. You can't say, well, my German heritage or my Irish or Scottish or whatever, it trumps my heavenly heritage. No, wrong. <laughs> we got to fix our hearts and our minds on things above. But wrath, you know what? Some people throw their golf clubs. Some people overreact to their children. Some people get road rage. Some people go off on Facebook and they start tirading on how they hate this and they hate that and this, that, and this and that. And you're like, are you even born again? I can't believe what I'm reading. I don't say, well, I don't necessarily say that for, if I know that someone in our church is doing that, I can talk with them on to the side, but that's the wrath that God's talking about. Um, it's passion. You're not thinking, you're just reacting. We need to respond. Malice, what is that malice? That malice is uh, naughtiness. <laughs> That's one of the definitions of it. You know, being naughty. Malice, it's, it's a wickedness. It's a troublesome. It's malice. Someone who has malice, it's like they, they're saying something under their breath. They're growling. It's that, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to have an axe to grind. We as believers, you're going to lose a lot of sleep and health and stress is going to be added to your life if you have axes to grind when Later, Paul and the Holy Spirit are saying here, you got to put on the new man. Let, you need to show mercy. Blasphemy, uh, we look at the blasphemy there. Um, the word blasphemy, you know, it's just evil speaking or, or railing or, you know, saying things in a way that is causing shame to the Lord, like joking too much about the things of God. That's... There's humor in the body of Christ, absolutely. I have a lot of fun and a lot of things are funny. But to, to make light of the things that God gave such a great sacrifice for, we gotta be very careful that that's not to be found among us. Um, I hear a lot of blasphemy, but when I walk into the room, it tends to tone down. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, okay, Justin, you know, that's okay. I'd rather be that salt, right? But filthy language. Okay, um, so thankful. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, vile conversation. I mean, some people, it's like they relish either gossip or they relish being able to find something that's just, like, makes you just, uh, gives, like, crude jokes. Hey, to pass the time, let's just say something that you'll never forget that will just totally scar your soul. No, I don't want to hear a crude, vile I don't want to hear a wicked conversation that I will not be able to forget. You tell a crude joke, we don't. But that's our kids come home from the bus, or they come home from a camp, or they come home from, and it's like, where did you learn that? Right? So I could tell you examples, but I'm going to spare that. So, but it's simply put, in the New Testament, that, that filthy communication shouldn't even be named among us. Rather, we're to let everything come out of our mouth for edification, to build up other people. And verse 9 I find very good uh, and helpful. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds. Someone may be watching this right now. I don't know. But I talked with them earlier. I saw them. How are you doing? Oh, you know, just faking it till I make it. It's just, or have you heard, living the dream. They said, faking it till I said, you don't have to be fake. It's okay to not be okay. You know, that's what we're here for, right? It's okay to not be okay. Christ takes our okayness or our funkiness and our not feeling very good, and he doesn't want us to lie about it. That's why we're praying after this. If you're not praying and coming here on Wednesday nights, come and pray with us at 730. We are to pray to be authentic. To Holiness comes when you confess and say, Lord, I need you, and let him cleanse you. So... And a lot of our, our issues, when we don't deal honestly with one another, we hide our sin, and we hide because of shame. And then, like James says, if you confess your sins one to another, if you have someone you can be accountable with, you do that so you can be healed. We're not out there to broadcast everybody's issues to everybody. But you need to have people that you can say, I'm struggling with this, and that we can build each other up, right? Is that what we want here? I, I know that that can happen more and more. 
and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. There's a passage that says we all with unveiled faces. We're not like Moses coming down from the mountain with a veil covering the, the glory of God. We're unveiled faces. We can see everything. Are beholding the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. He just keeps transforming us. And that's what this verse is also saying. We're renewed in knowledge according to the image of him. We're renewed in the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And there's no distinction. There's no Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, skinny and free. Uh, but Christ is all and in all. Galatians 3, uh, 27 through 28 kind of highlight this too, that there's not a distinction and I love that. Um, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are, are Christ, you belong to him, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Jesse, Guy, and I are not any better or worse than each other. We are children of God and equal to the rights and privileges of Jesus Christ. I love that. I came from a hierarchy type church where you little peons down there, we're going to guilt trip you all the time. We're up here because we're so holy. And if you want to be a saint, you better do some awesome things. Wait, no, 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 no. Read the Bible. It says that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're a saint. And read the Bible where it says there are no distinctions. There's neither slave nor free. There may have been some times in the Roman culture, as we'll see at the fourth chapter next week, Onesimus was Philemon, Philemon's slave but could have been maybe a, a believer longer, or there may have been some arrangements where a slave was actually an elder in the church, and their owner was just didn't have much responsibility because they became a believer afterward. The point is, we're all here for each other to help each other, and everybody's role is different, but God gives to each of us a measure of faith, and we don't take pride in our distinctions. We take pride in the work of Christ and how awesome he is to call us all worthy to be his children, the Father's children. Okay, therefore as elect, verse 12, of God, holy and beloved, put on the tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. A lot of problems in the church can be solved by this. Have you prayed about it? Are you willing to forgive them? Because this passage says here very clearly, just as you've been forgiven and you have a complaint about anybody, be willing and not only be willing, forgive them. Jesus put it this way, if you do not forgive others their sins, then your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. It's, it's very clear. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. The bond of perfection. Love. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love, but 1 Corinthians 12 talks about all these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues, the gifts of, uh, gifts of healing and, and gifts of uh, prophecy. You know, gifts on and on and on. But he says, let me show you a better way. You, if you can do all of that and you have not loved, you're a resounding cymbal, a gong, you're a drum set that's just making noise. But And if you give your body to the fire to be burned, it's nothing if you haven't loved. And we want God's love to shine through us. If we're true, First John, he says, if anyone says, I love God, yet he hates his brother, he's a liar and the truth does not abide in him. If you know God, you're going to love people who are made in the image of God. So let that show and if you want to be typified, if I want to be known for anything, I hope it's that I'm loving. I'd rather err on the side of being loving, but we can also hold people accountable when we love them. So it's not hypocrisy. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful once again. He wanted them to be thankful. He said that already in the letter. Be thankful. But that, I circled the word peace there. For me... The, the peace in the Old Testament, shalom, the, the peace, like Philippians 4 says, that guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus whenever you're, you're worried and you give it to the Lord right away and you thank him and you pray and ask him for help. That peace, which transcends all understanding, it sometimes defies reason, is going to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
and then that results in thankfulness. We are to be thankful in all circumstances. You may not be thankful for all things, but then there's another passage that says be thankful for all things because even the bad things, as we read in Romans 8, 28, work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes and those who love God. So we can be thankful in all circumstances. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, before we get to that last section, um, that's why you're here tonight. You're letting the word of Christ and the word of God dwell in you richly by sitting at the feet of Jesus. Hearing Pastor Bruce mention that this afternoon. Martha, Martha, you're so busy working. Sit at my feet, right? Um, we need to spend some time thinking about that. So let that word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And here's the other thing. What's that going to result in? You're going to want to teach other people, your children. You're going to want to teach other older women, teach younger women. Older men, teach younger men. You know, we're going to want to teach them. And I know you guys do. I'm sitting amongst a lot of teachers. So we want to teach and admonish. What does that mean there? Verse 16. We're to admonish one another. We're to um, reprove, gently warn. Okay? You may have to warn somebody, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, warn the unruly. Some people get unruly. They get unruly. Your kids get unruly. People in the church get unruly. Coworkers can get unruly. But especially in the body of Christ, what he's saying here is warn one another. Kindly, but warn each other. Like, hey, I had to learn this the hard way. Like, the, I, I need to consider myself. I'm not trying to pull this speck out of your eye. I had a plank in my eye. Let me tell you how it went for me and how the Lord delivered me. I want the same for you, right? I'm warning you because I don't want you to hurt like I hurt or like I, I saw someone else hurt. So it's a warning. And um, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, you know, admonishing, you may warn, but you also kind of uh, put to mind. It's a remembrance thing too. In Ephesians 5, Chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, greeting each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Same thing he's saying here. Different church, same sentiment. He's saying, have that melody of God in your heart. Have that desire to praise Him in your heart. And here's, some good, here's a very good rule for life. Verse 17. And whatever... You do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, when someone's born again, they're just, you know, I'm so thankful for the Lord. I'm so thankful for what he's given me to do. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to serve. If you're serving and you feel like you're doing it out of guilt, step back. Serve where you feel God's called you to. And many of you have done that. I've done that. Step back. Lord, what do you want me to do? And then do it. Do it with all your heart and do it for his glory. We'll get to that. Wives, this is some practical advice here. And be thankful when you serve. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them or harsh toward them. Very simple. He kept it simple. There's your marriage conference. You can pay me later. <laughs> right? Those two verses, that's all we need. I'm not trying to just diminish marriage conferences, but God kept it simple for a reason. And even single people, there's things for us. Um, I'm to love my wife, and my wife is, you know, if you're not submitting to one another in love, even in the church, it can be, people will scratch their head like, why do I even want that? A marriage, a healthy marriage should make people see Christ in the church. Um, children, Ephesians 6, 1, one of my favorite verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. That will be added to my children's memory verses. But <laughs> in all things, maybe not immediately, but you can give them some time frames, but they need to obey. Okay. Fathers do not, this is for me though. Oh, this one just tears me up. Okay. Fathers do, that's like a stake to the heart. 
Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Oh my goodness. I fail. But the Lord is merciful. He's gracious. So how do you provoke your kids? Sometimes you, you withhold privileges or you tease them. Or, have you ever seen somebody tease their child till they get them upset and then they give them the treat? It's just cruel and unusual, right? We don't do that. We have a natural affection for our kids. But there are times where I overreact or I lecture and I beat the... You know, Hey, this is the point I'm trying to make to you. Do you really understand the point? Like, really? Just take it easy. So that's for me. I have to look at my own life. Paul tells Timothy, you know, when you keep close watch on your doctrine and you read the scriptures and you teach others, you'll save yourself. So this is very much for me. But I hope it encourages you too. Bond servants, which you could easily say, um, employees in our modern times. Obey in all things your masters, your supervisors, your bosses, according to the flesh, not with eye service. Hey, the boss is around, we better get to work, right? No, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Can your prayer be when you walk into, into work, Father, bless the work of my hands, that it not be me working, but you working through me? Could that be your prayer? Could you say, Father, I want to please you today with what I'm doing at work. Father, I don't know what to do. Please give me wisdom with this project. Father, I don't know what to tell this person. That's how you do it, not as a men pleaser. We will stand and be accountable for how we serve at our workplaces. Or if you're volunteering, you're retired, how you use your time wisely. And whatever you do, these two verses, just like 17, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. We're in Ecclesiastes on Sunday mornings. And uh, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9, it says, Live joyfully with the, with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. He's so, so encouraging. Which he has given you under the sun. All your days of vanity, for this is the, your portion in life. And in the labor which you perform under the sun. Here we go. Verse 10. Of Ecclesiastes 9. Whatever your hand finds to do. Do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom. In the grave where you are going. Solomon's cynical. But he's saying do it with all your might. You're going to die. Isn't that encouraging? But God is saying here. Do it because you're going to be rewarded. Verse 24. Because he who does wrong. Will be repaid. For what he has done. For there is no partiality. I love that we have an impartial God. Who. Anything that's good in me. Is Christ living his life in me. My life is hidden in Christ with God. I don't desire to do good. It's Christ in me. So we live in light of that reward. Um, let's pray. And then I'll have Anthony come up. And we'll pray together. Lord we know. Clearly in your word. That you have called us. To put off the old man. To put off that which is sinful. But we know that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you have given us an eternal and a heavenly perspective. Thank you that there's no distinction that we are all, that you are all and in all. You're in all of us, Lord. There's no one more important or less important in the kingdom. Be with us as we pray. Be with us as a church. And be with the church at large that we would be bold for you and responsive to you. That you would move powerfully and revive us. And that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.